Thank you for having me today. Uh, one of the biggest lessons learned from the advent of the internet is that network effects are real and that they are powerful. The more users a network has, the more useful and valuable a network becomes. And once a network, once the network effects start kicking off, they're very difficult to contain. While Gen Z will always be remembered as the generation that brought us the ability to go viral, it was actually boomers and the generation before boomers, known as the silent generation, that first identified network effects and computer technology. In other words, what fuels our viral power. In 1965, Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, posited that the rate of innovation of computer technology doubles about every two years. And this is due to the efficiencies that are gained in technology innovations. Fifteen years later, Robert Metcalf, who was one of the inventors of the Ethernet, he built on Moore's Law, saying that the value of a computer network grows exponentially as you have more users and connections added to a network. So as this graph shows, this is the network effect taking off. And while Moore and Metcalf came up with these theories before I was even born, they remain relevant today because the constant for all successful technologies or networks is the adoption and use by society, by the people, by us. It is the, man, the demand of the people that drives innovation and disrupts the status quo. It is the sheer number of people connected, whether to the World Wide Web, to apps like Facebook or TikTok or whatever, that creates these network effects. So it's we, the people, that are the network, and therefore we are the power. While the internet has been one of the most powerful innovations of our age, it has significant challenges. The architect of the internet is limited because 30 years ago, we could not figure out how to allow for peer-to-peer -peer financial transactions. Mark Andreessen, who's the co-founder of Netscape, as well as Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, who co-founded PayPal, they all tried to create software that enabled the transfer of value peer-to-peer -peer through the internet. Nobody could figure out how to do this. So the internet was built on top of the traditional banking and credit card systems. But this is not the way that it was supposed to be. We just did not have the technology until Bitcoin. Blockchain technology, which is the technology that underpins Bitcoin, does not require an intermediary to facilitate the movement of value through the World Wide Web. These centralized intermediaries, they are susceptible to cyber attacks and corruption. As we all know too well, it's very easy to impersonate people online, and this has led to en entire cottage industries of fraudsters and scammers. Right now, if you go to Instagram and you look me up, my impersonator account has more followers than my actual account. <laughs> <laughs> True story. In 2021, this is a real issue. In 2021, the FBI estimates that cybercrime cost the U.S. $6.9 billion. This is a major industry. It's not just an issue. Globally, that number is estimated to be as high as $6 trillion. If cybercrime was a country, it would be the third largest country in the world. This is why we need blockchain technology. Bitcoin solves what's called the double spend problem. And thanks to Bitcoin, people can now transfer value online, peer to peer, safely and securely without having to go through intermediaries. And the blockchain industry is rebuilding the internet correctly this time. We're doing it on open blockchains, which is going to enable people, not middlemen, to have more control over our assets. And this will go down in history as one of the most important technological advances of our era, and it has spurred a Cambrian expo uh, explosion of innovation. We're only a decade in, and we're already seeing very meaningful examples of cryptocurrency and blockchain applications doing incredible things to advance freedom and prosperity globally. Uh, the first example is with building blocks. This is an initiative of the United Nations World Food Program. They've provided $325 million in cash transfers to 1 million refugees in Bangladesh and Jordan. This is the world's largest implementation of blockchain technology for humanitarian assistance. Prior to the launch of building blocks, the World Food Program relied on banks and other intermediaries to distribute food vouchers uh, in aid. 
Um, Building Blocks was able to streamline the financial allocation and expenditure of cash transfers for refugees by, bo by uh, bypassing the local financial sector and reducing transaction fees. And in Jordan, Building Blocks was able to serve the World Food Program, uh, saved the World Food Pro Program, the equivalent of $2.4 million in transaction fees. And those are funds that are now being redirected to help more people in need. Next, uh, please meet the first woman uh, tech CEO from Afghanistan. Her name is Roya Maboub. She founded a software development firm called Citadel. Um, they had contracts with the US and Afghanistan governments to develop software. Most of Roya's employees were women. Um, as you may know, women, most women are not able to have bank accounts in Afghanistan. So this caused challenges for Roya. Uh, from a payroll perspective, paying their employees if you don't have bank accounts. They had to come up with all these workarounds that were not reliable, inefficient, led to people losing money, took a lot of time, was very complicated. Roya heard about Bitcoin and she was like, we have nothing to lose, let's try to figure this out. And Citadel started teaching their employees about Bitcoin in 2013. And this created opportunities that Roya could have never predicted at the time. When the Taliban launched attacks on women who worked on computers, Roya, as well as many of her colleagues, had to flee the country. As a refugee, it's very difficult and unsafe uh, to bring cash or material possessions with you on this type of journey. They usually get lost or stolen. However, these women who started learning about Bitcoin and started saving in Bitcoin were able to bring their money with them on this dangerous journey because all they had to do was carry a piece of paper with the code written on it. And today, there are numerous women who fled the Taliban from Afghanistan that live here in the United States, as well as the European Union, and came here with their own resources that they earned on their own to restart their lives in a more safe place. All of this was done thanks to Bitcoin. These incredible stories were documented by the Human Rights Foundation, and they also helped some of these women flee to safety. And far from Afghanistan and Jordan, even in open societies, we can have inequities. Take, for instance, the art industry. This is an industry that's known for barriers of expression and funding and diversity. Sotheby's Auction House estimates that just 1%, just 1% of art auction sales and spending over the past 10 years, this past decade, was related to works of African American artists. Disadvantaged communities, however, are increasingly looking to non-fungible tokens and NFTs to sell their art. Between January 2020 and March 2021 alone, 58 black artists have sold 531 pieces of NFT art for a combined value of $700,000. For another example, Umbadama, this is a virtual art gallery that gives diverse artists both a platform to promote their art and to sell NFTs. And in their first year of operations last year in 2021, they sold over $120,000 in digital collectibles. We're seeing similar efforts being made to expand inclusivity through art with NFTs for women and other traditionally marginalized groups. These are just a couple ex examples of open blockchains providing people from all walks of life with a platform to participate in the digital economy on equal footing. The blockchain doesn't care how old you are, it doesn't care what your gender is, the color of your skin, your political philosophy. Uh, we are all equal on the chain. When it comes to the policy around crypto and blockchain, the industry faces challenges that are as old as time, literally. When the minute hand of the clock was introduced in Roman society, it was a significant innovation, but it was met with much pushback. Time was largely controlled by the state, powerful papal state. At the top of the hour, a large cannon would be shot to let the people know that an hour had passed, and then all the churches around the area would ring their bells to alert people that an hour had passed. The introduction of the minute hand was a threat to the state because it would disrupt their system and impact their way of life forever. The Pope preached that life was meant to live slowly, and the minute hand would ultimately give common people more control of their time. Before the Pope, this meant having less control of the common people. There was a lot of resistance by the state to add minute hands to clocks. The minute hand was even illegal at one point. 
Last week, I visited St. Peter's Square, and there's still a clock above the Pope's balcony without a minute hand on it. What did not slow was the pace of innovation. The railway system, which moved goods as well as workers up and down the country, became critical to the business and their workforce. And with the growth of the railways came the need for more precise time creeping to sync the, the, the train schedules. So it was ultimately the people who drove the adoption of the railway and by necessity the adoption of the minute hand that led to this technology reaching a network effect that was just simply impossible to contain. The state may have been able to stop minute hands from being added to clocks, but in the famous words of Galileo, a poor semuave and yet it moves. Crypto and open blockchains are giving people more control of their money, their data, their intellectual property, their assets, and it's seizing control from centralized institutions. This change should not be feared. It should be embraced because it embodies our values as Americans. In 2014, when we launched the Chamber of Digital Commerce, we saw that Bitcoin and the blockchain protocol would have the power to enhance and enable our freedoms. And as someone who worked on Capitol Hill, I knew that policymakers would play an important role in setting the policies that would influence the adoption and use of these technologies. While a lot of progress has been made in Washington, there's still a lot of work to do to establish a policy framework that promotes the development and use of this technology. For example, it remains unclear which regulatory agency plays what role in regulating the digital asset marketplace. The Securities and Exchange Commission has said cryptocurrencies will primarily be regulated as securities. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission regulates them as commodities. The Treasury Department treats them like currency and property. The answer to the age-old question of whether a digital asset is a, is a security under the SEC's jurisdiction or a commodity under the CFTC's jurisdiction remains unclear and imperfect. And if companies do not know what regulatory bucket an asset sits in, market participants do not know how to provide the necessary regulatory and compliance support. With no clear gui guidance, an entire marketplace where trillions and with tens of thousands of investors is making decisions based not only on financial risk, but legal risk too. This is why we filed an amicus brief in the case SEC versus Ripple Labs. In 2012, the currency XRP was launched. Over the next eight years, the industry treated XRP as a commodity and its market cap grew to over 25, 20, or sorry, $23.5 billion. Then in 2020, the SEC filed a suit against Ripple Labs claiming that XRP was a security. This led to XRP being delisted to crypto exchanges across the country and the world, and this led to the drop of XRP, uh, its value dropping as far as 57 point, uh, over 57 percent, um, or the equivalent of $13 billion of value. Because again, this is a, an asset that was out there in the secondary markets growing and building for over eight years. When this happened, this was a hit that was ultimately uh, a hit taken by the retail investors. Um, this whole situation could have been prevented if we had clear guidance from the SEC. Uh, just a little bit more detail on our brief, just to clarify the positions that we take. We are not taking a position on if Ripple's offer and sale of XRP as a security transaction. We also did not comment on the merits of the argument made by either, uh, either party of the case. Rather, we highlight for the court and make them aware that there is no federal law or regulation that governs the legal characterization of a digital asset recorded on a blockchain. So when you hear policymakers saying there is clarity, that is not true. We also urge the court to clarify that the law applicable to an investment contract is separate and distinct from the law applicable to the subject of an investment contract. So for example, the distinction between an investment in an orange grove enterprise versus the oranges themselves. Oranges are not securities, they're obviously commodities. Our profit preference would always be to have action taken by policymakers first to set clear and consistent rules to the road for the industry. However, absent that, this case appears to be a precedent setting forum that's gonna influence the future of the digital asset marketplace and the chamber will continue to serve as a friend of the court in this case and others moving forward. 
The next policy issue I think it's important to discuss today is the need for a level playing field for all market participants, regardless of their size or their standing in the market. Custodia is a bank that was founded by a crypto pioneer based in Wyoming with a state banking charter allowing the custody of both traditional and crypto assets. For the past two and a half years, Custodia waited for the Federal Reserve to review its application for a master account at the Fed that would allow Custodia to operate like other federal banks and receive access to the Fed's banking system for clearing transactions without having to use an intermediary bank. This would be significant, bringing crypto into the U.S. banking system in a groundbreaking way. But the Fed has delayed such applications, citing risk concerns as its rationale for delaying Custodia's application. Yet, <laughs> in the past few weeks, New York's banking regulator approved the Bank of New York Mellon's custodian application to begin holding Bitcoin and Ether for its customers. So in short, they gave one of the oldest banks in America a license to do what one of the most innovative banks in America had been seeking to do for almost three years. This action was met with fury from the crypto community. And today you can go on crypto Twitter and you can read comments from leaders in our community expressing their belief that the system is rigged. It's episodes like this that can lead to people losing faith and, tra and trust in the government. My point is not necessarily about the Bank of New York Mellon or Custodia in particular. It's about protecting innovation through competition. To protect the integrity of the regulatory system, regulators must ensure that market participants are not met with any appearance of favoritism. It's not the government's job to pick winners and losers. That is our job, the free market, the people's job. Which brings me to the third policy concern. Policymakers have made bipartisan calls for quite some time about the need for stronger consumer protections for cryptocurrencies. This is not a super well understood asset class. It has novel risk, yet it's been met with great demand. Today, it's estimated that over 15 million Americans, or over 40 million Americans, excuse me, already own crypto today. These Americans have been denied the opportunity to invest in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies through a familiar and a regulated investment product the Exchange Traded Fund, or ETFs. Over the past decade, there has been 16 attempts to bring spot Bitcoin ETFs to market, and the SEC has arbitrarily denied every single application. As a result, U.S. retail investors have been forced to invest in crypto outside of their brokerage and outside of the support of registered financial advisors. They've been left to navigate this space on their own. The time has come for U.S. investors to have access to an ETF that directly holds Bitcoin. You can read more about this in our report, The Crypto Conundrum, Why the SEC Won't Approve a Bitcoin ETF. Fundamentally, cryptocurrency and blockchain applications are software code, and code is speech protected by the First Amendment. This has gone all the way to the Supreme Court in the case Bernstein versus the United States. The court ruled that any government regulations preventing the publication of source code is unconstitutional. In August of this year, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC, sanctioned the Tornado Cash Mixer, which is an anonymizing software software program on the Ethereum blockchain. It was built to enhance privacy associated with cryptocurrency transactions. Unfortunately, the Tornado Cast Mixer was used to launder cryptocurrency from ransomware hackers and other nefarious actors. But just as any tool can be used for good or bad, Tornado Cash was also used by perfectly legitimate actors. But Tornado Cash was not a single person or an institution. It's a decentralized software program. <laughs> it, is, it, is, uh, it is run by smart contracts anonymously. Following this action, the Tornado Cash source code, as well as the source code to other projects with a similar name, and open source software developers associated with Tornado Cash were removed from GitHub. This has sent a chilling message to the entire technology community, not just the crypto community, that our rights to free speech that exist with open source codes are in jeopardy. While we are committed to protecting the cryptocurrency ecosystem from bad actors, 
Our policies must account for the unique and fast evolving innovations of blockchain and crypto. Rules for individuals and brick and mortar institutions may not be workable or appropriate for this, for this technology. Balancing national security interest with an environment that preserves privacy and innovation can be challenging, but these protections must not come at the expense of our foundational rights. If we lose our rights, what are we even fighting for? As Americans, we, the people, have a responsibility to fight for our freedoms, just as the many, many, many generations that came before us. We're at the early stages of the development of cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. It's hard to see or understand today just how much this technology is gonna impact our life as it becomes more integrated into business and society. It may be as subtle as the minute hand clocked, but brought about the advent of the railway industry. Or as boldly disruptive as the internet was transformed virtually every facet of the way we live and work. But what all of these technologies have in common as that they give control back to people of what is rightfully theirs, their time, their data, their money. And this has helped humanity reach new heights. Remember, what makes a network powerful is its size. The larger the network, the more powerful and valuable it is. And it is we, the people, that adopt technologies. We are the nodes, therefore we hold the power. We control the future by deciding what technologies we adopt, and we have an opportunity to expand freedom and prosperity by supporting policies that encourage the adoption of cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology throughout society. As inventor Leonardo da Vinci noted, nothing strengthens authority so much as silence. Where the state stands in the way of people using technology to allow them to exercise their freedoms or to expand freedom. It is our job to push back and fight for our rights to ensure they're preserved for future generations.